many of the people that I know who have tremendous amounts of money have huge fears around being poor. Mm -hmm. And so as, as, as an interesting thought, like a lot of people who don't have money see people who have money as thinking differently and they might in that they are more uncomfortable being poor than you are. Mm -hmm. Like it is more painful for them than it is for you. What is the business vision that you have? What's the number you want to reach? Yeah. And personally for the business, all these things. Yeah. I know you've talked about being a billionaire. It's just yeah. going to take a matter of time. Yeah. When do you think being a billionaire will happen for you? Um, I'd like to do five to seven for a billion. I like to hit 10 and 10. That's, uh, that's what I would like to do. So I want to have a billion or multi-billion dollar thing because I think it would be so cool. Like how cool would it be if we, if, if Jeff Bezos and, and Warren Buffett and Elon Musk and all those guys had documented everything that they learned throughout that path. All we get is these snippets, shareholder letters every once in a while. And it's just like, there's so little and they're going to die and we're going to lose it. Mm. We're going to lose all those lessons. And so part of it that excites me is just calling my shot because I think um, that always just like, uh, enlivens a little bit of the competition, but I do believe from a mathematical standpoint, we will get there. So I think the vision is another word for hope, right? It's hope for a better future. That's what we're marching towards, right? And you, and you basically give that away to someone. What <laughs> happens if we don't have a vision for our lives? I think you have less direction. And so you make less progress because you're not actually, you can't make progress unless you have direction because otherwise you're just moving. Mm -hmm. So like you can only have direct, like a vector, right? You know, movement in a direction. Um, if you know where you're trying to go. And so it's like the first thing we have to do is figure out where we're trying to walk and then we can mm -hmm. start walking there. Yeah. I have probably a little bit different approach with goals. Like I want to hit every goal. Like I don't like missing goals. And so for me, um, I don't like teaching myself or teaching other people that if I say something's going to happen, it doesn't happen. Because some people are like shoot for the moon, think really, like I think you absolutely should think really big. But then like, okay, how do I make a goal that like, and then, I, and then once I have that goal, do the activities that make it unreasonable not to hit it. Like all businesses start with debt. It just depends on what type of debt you're dealing with, right? And so if you don't have money, then that's fine. You just incur other debt. Like even when we think about how we built, how we're building the hold co right now at acquisition.com, like I am building more fixed cost in the infrastructure right now because of what I want it to be in a year, two years. Yes. And so if I wanted to run it, so like we already do reinvest, obviously a, a big percentage, but I would just reinvest more cash flow is a very regular reinforcer from a from a behavioral standpoint. Like you get this feedback directly every month of how you're doing, right? And so you, as entrepreneurs, or at least for me, I've been always a, ca a high cash flow entrepreneur. Like I'm, I've never been like a reinvest every dollar into the business. I like making money from my businesses. Um, but I've that has become a trait that I have learned to look at as my barometer every month. Like how am I doing? How am I doing? How am I doing? And so it would have to, so to the question of like, what would have to change in me? I would have to change how I measure success and then I'd have to reinforce the behavior in a different way. I'd have to measure it differently. I tend to always take the lowest risk path uh, when I can. Even, even the idea of like when I quit entrepreneurship, or sorry, when I quit my job to start entrepreneurship, it was because I knew that the path that I was on was guaranteed not to get to me where I want. Mm -hmm. So I had a zero outcome. And that, so this one, even though it was lower, like I had a low chance of success, the other one had 100% failure guarantee. And so that, so it felt like the lower risk option mm -hmm. for my long-term goals to quit my job and become an entrepreneur. I use cash flow at, from businesses as evidence to the fact that I'm not a failure. Mm -hmm. And so I use, I, I've always, like, it, it has been easier for me to change my conditions than to change who I am. And so I have used my material success and accolades to quiet the voices of not being good enough. A feeling of inadequacy, you know, feeling not good enough, feeling like you're not smart, feeling like you don't work hard, whatever it is. Like I have that stuff mm -hmm. all the time because you think that the external circumstance is gonna is gonna solve that. And I would say that it does to a degree. It becomes right. a crutch. Right. But then you have this crutch, and then you just tie yourself worth the, to the accolade or the thing rather than still yourself. And maybe I need to do more. I mean, I think part of it's so ingrained in us. If you think about us as kids, right? Like how do you how do you orient yourself with the world? You get reinforced or punished at all at all phases directly, indirectly, but you get reinforced or punished and the things that you get reinforced, you do more of, the things you get punished, you do less of, right? Like that's just how, how, we, how we learn behavior, how we learn to function in society, right? Touch that thing, ah, it hurts, it's, it's, we got punished. The reason external validation is so hard, at least for me, is because it's how I learned everything, mm. is because external validation gave, you know, gave me the, the directional guidance of, of what's good and what's not, and then as you get older, it's where am I gonna get that validation from? And so I would say that my external validation um, comes is still 100% there, it just comes from different sources. So I'm more selective on whose validation I want. Most times when we're afraid of something, 
it's not actually like this amorphous crowd that we're afraid of. It's like one or two people's opinion. Like it's your dad or it's your whatever it is, right? And you're worried about what they're going to think. And they're not even thinking about you. But you think they're thinking about it. They're thinking about <laughs> their dad. What does winning look like? It's achieving the potential. It's taking all this raw potential. The, 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 the line in the Bible that always scared me the most was to, who much is given, much is expected. And so for me, I always felt like I was given a lot. I expect a lot of myself because I see so much potential. Um, and I want to, tra- like, by the time I die, I would like to have nothing left in my potential tank. Um, and it just all have been transformed into, into my reality. Yeah. So that's what winning looks like. And what businesses have the best cash flow? So this will be relevant for everybody in the audience and also hits on what we were talking about with the wealth thing. Like wealthy people choose higher leverage opportunities and we went over what leverage was earlier. Um, the best businesses, especially in an inflationary period, are businesses that have low capital expenses. Okay. Um, and that's because Can if you- you have were, some examples? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. If, like, I'll give you opposite examples to make and then I'll drive it. So the, something that does have high capital expense, which is what you would not want to get into, would be like, Stuff that has lots of inventory, stuff that has lots of supply chain, lots of manufacturing, heavy equipment, things where you have to constantly buy more stuff in order to increase capacity, Mm -hmm. right? A low capital expense business are things like services, right? Services, uh, you know, digital businesses, uh, software is mixed because sometimes the development team can be considered a capital expense. It really depends on how you build the dev team. Most of those types of businesses produce more cash flow, have more pricing power. And so, I mean, that's what Warren Buffett invests in, right? It's high, you know, like, um, Insurance, Geico. Right. There's no capital. It's risk. They're literally assessing <laughs> risk. Air. It's it's yeah. math. Like the yeah. business is math. Yeah. Like if you really think it, it's just math, is the entire business of insurance. And what's crazy, just as a side note, is that a great way of figuring out the highest leverage businesses that exist is looking at the business that's been here the longest. Mm-hmm. Insurance has been here since before world, the world wars. Right. Bank, Banking. The banks have been around forever. Right, J.P. Morgan was in the 1800s. Wow. Right, the the ins- the biggest insurance companies, they're all 100 plus years old. They're they're found in the 1800s. And so, when you have a business that's lasted that long, to me, that's a great breadcrumb of like this thing has to print money. I'll give a couple rules of thumb if anyone wants yes. those. But like, if you're if you're building a service based business for us, I would I by all means I have to get gross margins above 80, percent which means five times the the cost of goods. Wow. So if it costs me 100 dollars a month, the minimum I'll charge is 500. Right. And so that also gets you to think about business differently, which is not necessarily even how much can I charge, but how can I provide value and make it cost as little to me? How can I be as efficient as possible? And if you think about what technology does over time, is technology takes something that's valuable and makes the cost of delivering it less. I think technology in general makes things easier for most people. I mean, because at the end of the day, it's just it's it's increased access mm-hmm. for more people. Yeah. And so I think to reach more people yeah. at any moment. Yeah, if I were just to use history as a as a as a guide, business has only gotten easier to get into. It's gotten more competitive and easier to get into. And so I think that what happens is just the arena gets bigger. So you got more gladiators, mm. so it's more competitive, but right. more people can walk in. In a capitalist system, it is a winner take all for most for for many, not all, but for many businesses and just by the nature of it, that does create social disarray. Mm-hmm. And it's just but the thing is is like it's still the best system that we have. We don't have a perfect system. Because the other, other systems remove incentive and humans right. are driven by incentive. Yeah. Even the survivorship bias, like every MLM in the world exists off the fact that there's that one guy who makes yeah. $500,000 <laughs> a month selling shake mix and the other 5 million shake mix producers are like, someday, one that'll day be I me. Get there, yeah. And it's just survivorship bias, right? But that's why the whole capitalist machine works. If you were to imagine life as a poker game, right? And we, we everybody you know grows up, they become 18 years old, they can go into the casino, they get a chip or 21, whatever age you can be. And then you get, you get a chip and then you sit down at the table and you're dealt cards, right? And there's all the other players around the table. And depending on the cards you're dealt and the skill you have, you, you begin to amass chips, right? And the difference between this fictitious, you know, casino and the casino of life is that in the real world, you can amass chips, you cash out, you have a big wad of money, and you walk out the door. But in the casino of life, when the Grim Reaper taps you and tells you it's, tells you it's time, you have to get up from the table, but your chips stay on the table and they push them to the middle to be distributed by everybody else mm-hmm. and continue to get played for. And that's when you realize that it was a fake game with rules that never mattered to begin with. The desire for legacy is the desire to cheat death. Like that's what it stems from. It's like, we don't want to die. We want to last forever. And so we want to make something that is impermanent. And so we fool ourselves into thinking that the accolades and the material success and the books we write, whatever, are going to last forever. And they're probably not, right? And so 
Like, I mean, the sun's going to disappear at some point, right? So, right, like, right. so like, if we don't do anything before then, like, at the very least, that's going to happen. And so if that is the inevitable outcome, I think it shifts the way people think. I know that acquisition.com is going to be, I think, significantly bigger than, sure. than, 